everybody, and welcome to today's Barnes Takeout. My name is Amy Gillette. I'm a researcher here at the Foundation. Now, today we're going to head up to gallery number 15 to look at this exquisite flower piece by the French artist Philippe Parpet, um, painted in the 1790s. And before we zoom into that, let's take a quick look at its context here at the Foundation. Let's get a little bit closer. And as you may know, Dr. Albert Barnes was responsible for the display that we still have today where he grouped both paintings, sculptures, and decorative arts purely on formal terms. And so we find our flower piece displayed immediately underneath a very similar flower piece that I think was produced by an artist who might have worked with Parpet, maybe even one of his daughters. Um, a post-Byzantine icon of the nativity that perhaps Barnes um, saw as sharing its incredibly rich and vibrant tones of scarlet and gold with um, areas of the parpet painting like this tulip right here. Um, I think we can maybe see the same color relationships with this um, painting from Korea. And, and even the, um, the decorative objects like this hinge up here shared in the same discourses where maybe Barnes saw in these um, scrolls up here an echo of the organic forms of the flowers. And so with that being said, let's zoom in a little and look more at our particular flower piece. So here we are. The first thing I'd like to take a, a look at is the signature that you can see on the marble ledge of the table or counter and zoom in even closer. This is how we know the artist. It says parpet, and then you might be able to see the year, the um, numbers one, seven, nine. And so we get the attribution to Philippe Parpet and the, the year 1790-something, um, whatever, whatever the number was, is cut off over there. And we can see the wood grain, the veins of the marble, and start to look at the different flowers and fruits that he has depicted for us. On the one hand, we can see these grapes up here that are so ripe that they're bursting, green ones as well as purple. We can see some peaches starting to look at the vase with these, let's just take a look at these drips of water running down its side. And then all kinds of flowers, a peony with water drops, these little daffodils with the orange centers of rose, um, hellebores or maybe anemones over here. I think that these are um, maybe white periwinkles, lilacs. Um, I think a, a gladiolus and then this absolutely glorious Let's take a close look here. Um, red and yellow striped tulip that a hundred years ago in Holland might have caused somebody to take out a second mortgage for this beautiful rarity um, among, among flowers. And so we have this flower piece that Parpet has given us that is just so palpably realistic that um, you almost feel, I think, like you're putting your face in a real bouquet of flowers right there, except, you know, you think about it, I, I think about it, and I imagine walking around my own gorgeous neighborhood in Philadelphia, and the daffodils that had been blossoming have faded, but um, the peonies are just coming out. I know that the roses are yet to come, grapes ripen in the autumn, and so what we have here is really not reality so much as a form of hyper-reality with this artificial simultaneity going on with it. And so in order to figure out a context, let's look a little more at the artist and historical context to figure out what's going on. Now, Philippe Parpet, we know, was an artist who entered the Royal Porcelain Factory in the year 1755. Um, his name is written down in factory records where whoever was the author wrote that Parpet knows how to use color well and draw a little, but he promises to improve and has a sweet character, quiet and hardworking. But after only two years, uh, the records say that Parpet disappeared suddenly without anyone knowing where he had gone. But the artistic records say that he spent about 15 years working in Paris as an enameler which probably explains a degree, along with his porcelain career, of exquisiteness in his botanical illustration. 
But then he returned to um, to the Severed Porcelain Factory and became, at that point, one of their chief flower painters. And so the improvement that the earlier recorder had foreseen, it seems, did in fact play out, as we ourselves can see. And being a, a chief flower painter at Sever meant that he produced a good number of stock compositions to be reproduced in porcelain and painting for the homes of the well-to-do, working hand-in-hand -hand with botanists and botanical illustrators. So that brings us to the topic of botanical illustration, which had a very long and kind of complicated history. We know that it dated back at least to Roman times because we've got this Roman author named Pliny the Elder who was sort of skeptical about it, writing on the one hand that um, artists seem to like to introduce different colors um, in a way that wasn't quite faithful to nature. And he did note too, he wrote that it's not enough for each plant to, to be painted at one period only of its life, since it alters its appearance with the fourfold changes of the year. And so for Pliny, the stakes clearly are high that a botanical specimen ought to be reproduced pretty exactly. And this is a tradition that extended into Byzantine to medieval botanical illustration, because as much as, say, people, artists might abstract holy figures in art for different purposes, if you're using a plant for medicine and most botanical illustration, much of it, I should say, you'll find in medical treatises. If you're going to be ingesting the plant for medicine, you really want to know what you're looking at, right? But um, on top of that tradition, was actually the symbolic tradition, and um, that was very common in medieval art. And to get a sense of that, we're going to take just a quick peek. A painting that we'll look at in a little while um, with, with another Barnes takeout, a 15th century image of a Madonna and child in a garden. And as much as this artist himself um, would have drawn on botanical illustration as perpetuated through the Middle Ages. I just want to take a, a little look down at the corner here where we've got this freshwater stream populated by a couple different types of mollusks over there, coral, pearls, um, along with things like strawberries and violets, um, all of which would tap into some prayer or symbol about the Christ child or Virgin Mary. And so this sort of symbolism did carry into Let's go back now. The most immediate precedents for flower pieces such as parpets, which were produced in, um, in, in the Netherlands, mostly in, in the 1600s, where flowers, like I mentioned, um, the, the, the tulip is being a, a popular rarity, having just been brought in from um, the Levant into Northwestern Europe. Plus this, um, so there's this idea of conspicuous consumption, um, from that, as well as the theme of vanitas, which means that everything in the world will ultimately pass away, which was also articulated by the sort of bringing together unnaturally of all these different flowers that bloom and fade at different times. But Parpet's images did take on a further meaning from a renewed emphasis on botany. So to get back to that, let's think quickly. That in the 18th and 19th century, it's a period of time that people often called the Enlightenment. And part of that, uh, as pertains to our particular flower piece, was bringing botany under the umbrella of the empirical sciences and bringing those sciences into the homes of the middle and upper classes. For, for example, um, botanical books by Carl Linnaeus were incredibly popular and widely read. Another factor that was rather new was global exploration and the introduction into Europe of um, previously unknown to them um, types of, of flora that they were eager to, to categorize, to depict, to classify scientifically. Um, there is also this new aesthetic as well as moral tradition of the picturesque um, that people, that authors such as the famous writer Voltaire um, cultivated. And you could, um, you could be exposed to this by reading authors like Voltaire, by wandering in your own pleasure garden, by bringing these values 
on display in your home by bouquets that maybe now you've grown in a, a greenhouse or hothouse, or the display of a painting such as parpets. And so in some parpets flower piece, I would say, exists between the earlier themes of, um, of the long tradition of botanical illustration, um, its perpetuation into medieval symbolism, which, by the way, I should I should note to a degree, um, flowers did retain conventional symbolism, such as the peony for good fortune, for for riches, um, for good luck in marriage, a rose for love, for passion, and so on. Um, so it care it does carry on botanical illustration and symbolism, reinvigorated for Parpet's own time by these new ideas about the empirical sciences. Um, about the cultivation of plants, as well as attendant virtues, about this idea of the picturesque. And with these, it anticipated some other bouquets that we'll see in our collection, like some gorgeous ones by Vincent van Gogh, in which flowers take on interiority and emotion. And so thank you so much for joining today. That's it for today's Barnes Takeout. May you be well. Thank you. I'm Tom Collins, Neubauer Family Executive Director of the Barnes Foundation. I hope you enjoyed Barnes Takeout. Subscribe and make sure your post notifications are on to get daily servings of art. Thanks for watching and for your support of the Barnes Foundation.